Welcome to tonight's general meeting featuring Scott Stossel. Um, as you probably know, our general meetings are discussions where we, we invite experts to talk about mental health. And in this case, it's a little bit of a, an expert and a lived experience. So we're, we're kind of blending it with our storytelling program, um, as Scott Stossel tells a little bit of his story with anxiety. And without further ado, um, I'm going to let Lou go ahead. Actually, just kidding. A little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> if questions arise during during the discussion, um, please feel free to uh, send your questions in the chat box to me directly, um, and I will collect questions for the end. And then, if we get a, a bunch of questions during the talk, I'll go, I'll make sure to um, call your names out, and you can unmute your mic at the end during our Q and A, um, just to keep from there being any interruptions. Um, and now, without further ado, I'm going to let our executive director, Lou, introduce Scott Stossel. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lou. I'm the executive director of NAMI. Thank you for joining us tonight. I would like to introduce Scott Stossel. Um, Scott is an award-winning journalist, and he is the current editor of The Atlantic magazine. He is the author of a New York Times bestseller titled My Age of Anxiety, Fear, Hope, Dread, and the Search for Peace of Mind. In 2014, Scott was awarded the Voices of Mental Health Award by the Jed Foundation and the Eric Erickson Institute Prize for Excellence in Mental Health Media. Um, Scott has um, written articles that have appeared on, in The Atlantic, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Boston Globe, The Wall Street Journal, and The New Republic. And we extend a warm welcome to you, Scott. Thank you for joining us. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Amanda and and Lou. And it's good to um, see you all. Uh, I'm out on the East Coast, so it's a little later here, um, and I'm up in my attic. Um, but I'm glad to be speaking to you all um, on the on the subject uh, of anxiety. So, I guess I'd start by saying there's a there's a certain irony to my being on screen here, you know, talking to you today. Um, I'm here in part because a few years ago, uh, as as Lou mentioned, I, I wrote a book about anxiety. And part of that book is about my debilitating, it's about all aspects of my debilitating anxiety, but in particular, one, one particular part of it um, relates to my public speaking um, anxiety. And yet here my reward, this was the reward for publishing the book, as it were, um, mm -hmm. for having written about my public speaking anxiety is that I get to stand up here or sit here in front of you and do more public speaking. So, um, you know, if I get overwhelmed with anxiety, you may see me um, have a panic attack. I hope that won't happen. Um, but if it does bear with me and if it gets really bad and I have to, um, you know, run off the screen, which has happened before, uh, I promise I will send you all copies of my book as compensation and you can just skip to page 96 um, because that gives kind of a rough scientific explanation of what would have um, happened there. So um, when my book first came out, um, a frequent comment I got was a variant of, you know, what a brave book. And I always thought that was sort of a perverse thing because the only thing I am feel like I'm brave about is admitting my lack of bravery. Um, that is to say, you know, I reveal what feels to me like my weakness, um, my anxiety or my cowardice. So when people would tell me that I was, you know, brave for coming out as anxious, what I would hear them saying in my head is stupid <laughs> because why would I choose to do what most people um, would have the common sense not to do. That is to say, reveal my vulnerability and my weakness uh, to the world. And I will come back in a little bit. I want to come back to this idea of my of revealing vulnerability because actually it's become important to my current mental health regimen. But first, let me talk a little bit about you know how did I come to write about anxiety and you know what was my authority? Um, what authority do I bring to that? Well, the main authority I bring, uh, you know, I am a journalist, and so I did a lot of reporting and research, but mainly um, my authority is that I've been anxious for my entire life. Um, I've frozen mortifyingly on stage at public lectures and on several occasions, as I mentioned, have been compelled to run off stage. I've abandoned dates, walked out of exams and had many breakdowns during job interviews uh, and on plane flights and train trips and car rides and simply walking down the street sometimes um, on ordinary days, doing ordinary things, reading a book lying in bed, talking on the phone, sitting in a meeting, playing tennis. I have thousands of times across the course of my life been stricken by a pervasive sense of existential dread and more than that, beset by these physical symptoms of nausea, vertigo, shaking, um, you know, GI trouble, 
sweating, blurred vision, and a panoply of just other really debilitating physical symptoms. And even when I'm not actively afflicted by such acute episodes, uh, I'm buffeted by sometimes obsessive worry um, about my health and my family members' health, about finances, about work, about the rattle in my car and the dripping in my basement, about the encroachment of old age and the inevitability of death, about everything and nothing. And sometimes this worry gets transmuted into low-grade physical discomfort, what um, psychiatrists would call somatization, you know, so stomach aches, headaches, pains in my arms and legs, vertigo, or a general malaise as though I have the flu. Um, and at various times, I've developed anxiety-induced difficulties, breathing, swallowing, even walking um, due to vertigo. These difficulties then become obsessions, which consume all of my thinking. And then I have also suffered at various times, um, and some of them more or less continuously, from a number of specific phobias. Um, and to name a few, enclosed spaces, which is claustrophobia, heights, which is known as acrophobia, uh, being trapped far from home or being afraid to leave the house when it gets really bad, which is agoraphobia. Um, germs, which is basilophobia, speaking in public, which is usually grouped under as a subcategory of social phobia, flying, aerophobia, vomiting is a unusual one um, in men, but one that I have particularly badly, and that's called emetophobia, and naturally fear of vomiting on airplanes, which is aeronosophobia. So like depression, um, anxiety is a quote unquote, you know, minor mental health ailment, um, especially compared to disorders um, that I know, you know, a number of you and your families may deal with that have come with acute psychosis or delusions or major emotional dysregulation. But I will tell you that when you're in the throes of anxiety, uh, it doesn't feel minor. Um, and for people who are afflicted with, you know, other comorbid diagnoses, like whether that's bipolar or schizophrenia or eating disorders or what have you, throwing anxiety on top of that can just make everything so much worse and so much more complicated to treat. So for me, this all started at a young age. I was a I was a very shy kid. I was sensitive, prone to crying at the slightest provocation. Um, when I was in elementary school, I had terrible separation anxiety. And if I was home with a babysitter, I would be abjectly terrified. Not that it was a hypothetical thing, but I was convinced that my parents had died in a car crash or had abandoned me. Um, and in fact, by the time I was seven, I had literally worn grooves in the in the floor of my room uh, and the, on the carpet from just pacing around trying to will my parents to come home, um, which they always did. And yet somehow that never made me feel any better. Um, you know, starting about first grade, I would spend nearly every afternoon in the school nurse's office, sick with psychosomatic headaches, begging to go home. By third grade, it was that stomach aches had replaced headaches, but my daily trudge to the infirmary remained the same. And I managed to, you know, keep myself in school despite the anxiety. But once I got to high school, um, uh, you know, seventh and eighth grade were terrible. I bit, bit, and I'll talk a, you know, a little bit, barely managed to stay in school and out of the psychiatric hospital. But, you know, once I got to high school, I was a pretty good athlete, but I would play tennis and my anxiety over competitive situations was so acute and unbearable that I would purposely lose matches because I just had to get out of that situation. Um, a few other examples, you know, on the, I had one date <laughs> um, in high school and on that only date, um, you know, it was going reasonably well. And when the young lady leaned in for a kiss during a romantic moment, we were outside um, gazing at constellations through her telescope. I was so overcome by anxiety that I had to pull away because I was afraid I would throw up. And my embarrassment was such that I stopped returning her phone calls and just kind of retreated in, in shame. So in short, I have, you know, since the age of about two, been a twitchy bundle of phobias and anxiety. And I have since the age of 10, when I was first taken to a mental hospital for evaluation and then referred to a psychiatrist for treatment, tried in various ways to overcome my anxiety. And so here's just some of what I've tried um, over the years. Um, individual psychotherapy, um, now for multiple decades, family therapy, group therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, rational emotive therapy, or RET, acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, hypnosis, meditation, interoceptive exposure therapy, in vivo exposure therapy, supportive expressive therapy, uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR, which is supposed to be good for trauma, um, massage, prayer, acupuncture, yoga, stoic philosophy, and audio tapes that I ordered off a late night infomercial one night. Uh, also medication, lots of medication. Um, Thorazine was the first one that I was prescribed, which is an early generation antipsychotic, um, but also imipramine, desipramine, 
chlorpheniramine, Nardil, Buspar, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Welbutrin, Effexor, Alexa, Lexapro, Cymbalta, Luvox, Trazodone, Abilify, Gabapentin, Lavoxyl, Propranolol, Tranxine, Serac, Centrax, Valium, Librium, Ativan, Xanax, Clonopin. And then as I got older um, and into my middle-aged, uh, also beer, wine, gin, bourbon, vodka, and scotch, um, which was very effective um, for short periods of time, but did not turn out well. Um, <laughs> I can tell you when um, that became my main um, medicine. Um, of all those, you know, what's worked? Well, nothing. Um, and that's not entirely true. I mean, some drugs have helped a little for finite periods of time. So that combination of Thorazine and Amipramine when I was in middle school basically combined to keep me out of the psychiatric hospital in the early 1980s when I was in middle school and just ravaged by anxiety. I mean, my parents used to have to look physically force me to school and I would lie at home, you know, screaming in terror every night. It was just awful, but I got through it with the help of that medication and, and, and psychotherapy. And then, um, in, in my twenties, when I was struggling with, um, depression and anxiety, um, dizipramine, which is another tricyclic antidepressant got me through that. Um, Paxil, which was the first SSRI or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor that I took, got me about six months of significantly reduced anxiety in my late twenties before the fear broke through again. And then I will say, and I'll come back and talk about this more, but CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure therapy, um, aside from di some disastrous episodes, which are comical in retrospect, but were not fun at the time um, that went awry, I describe in the book. Um, exposure therapy has worked and, and mindfulness meditation have been significantly helpful in various ways um, for periods of time. But while some of this has worked for periods, uh, nothing has fundamentally reduced the kind of underlying anxiety that seems woven into my soul and kind of hardwired into my body. Um, you know, as Papa would say, I am who I am anxiety wise. And as the years pass, my hope of being, you know, cured of my anxiety has faded into more of a resigned desire to come to terms with it and to manage it. So I wanted to tell you a little bit, um, I'll come back to how I manage it, but I want to tell you a little bit about, you know, why did I ultimately decide to write a book about anxiety? Um, and it's because, and this story I think about, um, tells a little bit about the different theoretical and clinical approaches to understanding and treating anxiety. So uh, almost 20 years ago, when I, I was about to publish my first book, um, and uh, which was a biography of Sergeant Shriver, who was the founder uh, of the Peace Corps. And as the tour was about to begin, um, I was suddenly seized by terrible anxiety that because I knew that my book tour was going to have to involve making public presentations and going on television and going into auditoriums. And I was terrified. And my dread of the book tour was so severe that several months um, before it was to begin, I started having panic attacks if I even had to watch somebody else give a talk um, or see someone else in public speaking on in a movie, I would have a panic attack. Um, and I was feeling desperate enough that I sought help from multiple sources. And so I went first to a prominent psychopharmacologist at Harvard. And he said, you know, when I went in to consult with him, you have an anxiety disorder. Um, after he took my case history, he said, fortunately, this is highly treatable. We just need to get you properly medicated. So I would, but I would gave him my standard objections to reliance on medication. I worried about side effects and dependency. And he resorted to the cliche, um, but nonetheless potent diabetes argument, which goes like this. And some of you may have heard this. Your anxiety has a biological, physiological, genetic basis. It is a medical illness like diabetes. And if, if, if you were diabetic, you wouldn't have such qualms about taking insulin, would you? And you wouldn't see your disease as a moral failing, would you? Well, I had versions of this discussion with various psychiatrists over the years, and I'd try to resist whatever the latest drug was, feeling that this resistance was somehow noble or moral, and that reliance on medication evinced you know, my weakness of character, and that my anxiety was an integral and worthwhile component of who I am, and that there was redemption in suffering, until inevitably my anxiety would become so acute that I would be willing to try anything, and I would go on another medication. So as usual in this case, I capitulated, and as the book tour loomed, I was I once again elevated the dosage of the SSRI antidepressant I was on, which was Celexa at the time, and started a course of benzodiazepines, um, basically Xanax and Clonopin. But I was still filled with dread about the book tour. So I also went, um, in addition to this Harvard psychopharmacologist, to the Center for Anxiety Disorders at Boston University, which specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. And there I was assigned to a young but highly regarded Stanford-trained psychologist. And the, the irony was the first thing she said was, um, we've got to get you off these drugs. 
Um, and a few sessions later, she actually offered to take my Xanax from me and she and, and lock it in a drawer in her, her desk. And she actually opened her drawer um, and took some bottles that had been deposited there by some of her other patients. And she actually held one up and shook it <laughs> for, for effect. Um, and she said, these drugs are a crutch that were preventing me from truly experiencing and confronting my anxiety. And if I didn't expose myself to the raw experience of anxiety, I would never learn that I could cope with it on my own. And, you know, she was right. I, I knew this is, you know, from, from my reading, exposure therapy is based on fully experiencing your anxiety, which is hard to do if you're taking anti-anxiety medications. But my fear was with the book tour looming and the stakes feeling fairly high, what if in fact I couldn't cope with the anxiety? So I went back to Dr. Harvard, the psychopharmacologist, and I described what Dr. Stanford had proposed. And he said, it's your call. But your anxiety is clearly so deep rooted in your biology that maybe the only way you'll be able to get to the point where any kind of behavioral therapy can begin to be effective is by taking the edge off your physical symptoms with drugs. And I said, well, what if I get addicted to Xanax and I have to be on it all my life? Because I knew that, you know, benzodiazepines can be dangerously dependency inducing and too sudden withdrawal from them can induce bad and dangerous side effects. And he said, well, so what if you do? I have a patient coming in this afternoon who's been taking benzos for 20 straight years. So at my next session with Dr. Stanford, I told her that I was afraid to give up my benzos. And I related to what I related to her, what Dr. Harvard had said. And she looked betrayed. Um, and I actually thought she was going to cry for a moment. So after that, I stopped telling her about my visits um, with Dr. Harvard. And I felt like I was you know, having illicit consultations with him. And interestingly, you know, I, I, some months later, uh, I read in the Boston Globe that the newspaper that that, that Dr. Harvard was treating um, there was a, a depressed gorilla, um, believe it or not, at the local zoo, the Franklin Park Zoo, and Dr. Harvard was treating the gorilla um, with the same antidepressant that he was giving to me, Selexa. So, you know, what to do? On the one hand, Dr. Harvard was telling me that I, like the gorilla, had a medical problem um, that needed pharmaceutical intervention. And on the other hand, Dr. Stanford was telling me that my problem was not principally a biological one, but cognitive. Uh, and if I could simply correct dysfunctions in how I thought um, through cognitive reframing and direct exposure to my fears, then my anxiety would be reduced. And in fact, the drugs, Dr. Stanford said, were impeding my ability to address these dysfunctions in an effective way. So I kept trying to cut down on my medication and would sometimes even succeed at this in small ways, but ultimately I would always be overwhelmed again with the anxiety and have to resort miserably to sort of panicky fumbling through my pockets for the Xanax. So as much as I would have liked to have cured myself through fixing my thinking or you know acclimating my amygdala, which is kind of the seat of the fear response in the brain, I seemed always to be ending up like that depressed gorilla in need of chemical adjustments to my neurotransmitters to fix my anxious, broken brain. Anyway, this experience, you know, the discrepancy in how these two well-meaning and, and both very well-trained therapists approach my anxiety fascinated me um, and st st struck me as interesting fodder for an exploration of the rich array of factors, you know, genetic upbringing, cultural that contribute to anxiety, um, especially since, you know, given in my own case, I feel that my anxiety is rather overdetermined. Um, that is to say, I've got clear genetic basis for it. You know, anxiety runs in my family as it tends to, I think, uh, you know, many studies show that genes account for up to 40% of, of anxiety disorders. My great grandfather, my mother's grandfather spent a lot of time as an inpatient at McLean hospital, um, in the 1940s and fifties, uh, outside of Boston. Um, uh, uh, he got electroshock therapy for his severe anxiety and what they then called neurotic depression. 50 years later, I would find myself at that same hospital getting evaluated um, for my anxiety. Um, but anxiety, in addition to having, you know, genetic causes also has upbringing related causes. It's contagious. Um, you know, my mother was a super anxious, super overprotective mother. And my dad was sort of a um, emotionally absent alcoholic father, which is sort of a classic recipe for developing various psych psychopathologies, in particular anxiety. And there's even evidence that, you know, cultural, your cultural history can produce anxiety. So, you know, my father was Jewish and my mother is a wasp who subscribed wholeheartedly to the notion that there is no emotion and no family issue that should not be suppressed. So I'm sort of a mixture of like Jewish pathology and wasp pathology. Like a, a, I'm a neurotic and histrionic Jew trapped inside uh, a neurotic and repressed wasp. Um, it's like, no wonder I'm anxious. I'm like Woody Allen trapped inside of John Calvin or something. 
anyway, so in the book, I use myself as a case study through which to explore the multifarious causes of clinical anxiety and also to branch off and talk about kind of the cultural and scientific history of it. Um, but I thought it might be also useful to tell you a little bit about like what is, um, and you know, some of you may well know this through um, your own experiences or the experiences of your of your loved ones, but what is the day-to-day -day experience of anxiety and particularly panic disorder like? Um, you know, and there are times when I've been reduced almost to the point, well, to the point of being housebound for stretches of time where, you know, it's a, it's a degree of agoraphobia, again, that fear of leaving the house where I, I can't leave the house without, you know, terrible anxiety. Um, happily, that doesn't happen too often. More often, um, anxiety and particularly panic will come on very fast and sort of situation-based caused by a trigger, usually something, some stressor, you know, whether it's a plane flight or, having to do public speaking or just an um, anxious social interaction. Sometimes it can be even just a physical feeling that I have. But so for instance, you know, not long ago, I was sitting in my office reading an email when vaguely at the edges of my consciousness, I noticed that I'm feeling a little warm and I've got, you know, I'm a super hypochondriac with kind of medical anxiety. And so I'm thinking, you know, is it getting hot in here? And suddenly awareness of the workings of my body are like forefront of my consciousness. I'm no longer thinking about work. Is it getting warm in here? Do I have a fever? Am I getting sick? Will I pass out? Will I vomit? Will I, in one way or another, be incapacitated before I can escape or get help or get to safety? And, you know, I have written a book about anxiety. I have spent years researching this. I am steeped in knowledge of the phenomenon of panic. I know as much as any lay person could about the neuromechanics of an attack. I've had thousands of them across my life. So you would think that this knowledge and this expertise would help me. And to be sure, occasionally it does. You know, sometimes I can recognize the symptoms of a panic attack early on and can kind of head it off at the pass or at least restrict it to what's known as a limited symptom panic attack, which is sort of more tolerable. But too often I have an internal dialogue that goes something like it did on this recent day. So I say to myself, you're just having a panic attack. You're fine, relax. What if it's not a panic attack? What if I'm really sick this time? What if I'm having a heart attack or a stroke? It's always a panic attack. Just do your breathing exercises, stay calm, you're fine. But what if I'm not fine? You're fine. Every one of the last 782 times when you thought you were having a panic attack and you thought it might not be a panic attack, it was a panic attack. Okay, I'm relaxing. I'm breathing in and out. I'm thinking the calming thoughts that the meditation tapes have taught me. But just because the last 782 instances were panic attacks, that doesn't mean the 783rd one is too, right? What if I'm having a stroke this time? You're right. Let's get out of here. So sitting in my office while something like this uh, sequence of thoughts is flowing through my head, I go from feeling slightly warm to feeling hot. I begin to perspire. The left side of my face starts to tingle and then go numb. See, I say to myself, I am having a stroke. Um, I'm suddenly aware that the fluorescent lights in my office have a strobe-like quality and are flickering dizzily. I feel a terrible vertiginous teetering, like the furniture in my office is moving around, like I'm about to topple forward onto the ground. I grip the sides of my chair for stability and my chest is tightening and my bowels are loosening. And as my dizziness increases and my office is swirling around me, my physical surroundings no longer feel quite real. I, I start to have this feeling of depersonalization. And my thoughts are racing, but the three most prominent are, I'm going to vomit, I'm about to die and I've got to get out of here. So I bolt unsteadily from my chair and I'm sweating like crazy and I'm just trying to get out and I'm desperately hoping I won't run into anyone because I feel like that will be embarrassing. So I run out of my office. Um, you know, if I'm going to have a, if I'm going to have a stroke or die, I, 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 I feel like that would be embarrassing. Like, I don't know why I'd be embarrassed because I'll be dead, but um, I'm going to make a break for it. So I head for the uh, emergency stairway and I open the door and I, um, push through the fire door. And, um, you know, when I get into the stairwell, finally, I feel a little bit of relief because I'm like, okay, I'm out of public view and my anxiety recedes a little bit. And I'm on the seventh floor and I'm running down the staircase. But, you know, by the time I reach about the third floor, my legs are starting to shake. And if I'd been thinking rationally, if I could have, you know, calmed down the limbic part of my brain, the lizard part of my brain and made better use of my frontal cortex, which is where rational thought takes place, I could have concluded correctly that the quaking in my legs is a natural result of a sympathetic autonomic nervous system fight or flight response, which causes trembling in the skeletal muscles. And 
I'm also descending the stairs. So it's natural that my legs would be a little shaky, but at this point too far gone into the catastrophizing logic of panic to access my rational brain, I conclude that my quaking legs are a symptom of complete physical breakdown and that I am indeed about to die. So as I descend the final two flights, I'm wondering whether I'll be able to reach my wife from my cell phone to tell her I love her and to ask her to send help before I lose consciousness and possibly expire. And then the embarrassing thing is this actually happened. You know, I get to the bottom of the stairs and I think I was moving so fast, you know, from the inside, when you come up to the door, there's a motion detector that's supposed to detect as you approach the door and then it unlocks the emergency door and you can go outside. But I think I got, I, I slammed through before the motion detector could activate. And so I literally slam into the door, get knocked backwards onto my rear end. And I hit it so hard that there's the exit sign ab above the door has a plastic casing on it and it falls off the exit sign, hits me on the head, lands on the ground with a clatter. And um, I'm outside the lobby and the, the door to the lobby opens and the security guard is like, what is going on in here? Are you okay? And I'm like, I'm sick, um, which was true. Um, but, you know, mentally ill is what I meant. So if any of you suffer from a uh, panic disorder, this experience will likely um, sound, you know, familiar in one way or another. Um, if you've never had a panic attack, it probably sounds really strange. Um, but I hope it conveys a sense of what the experience of panic anxiety is like. Um, its power to overwhelm a usually rational brain and a normally functioning body is remarkable and at times you know, debilitating. So of course, while these anecdotes convey something about the experience of anxiety, they also reveal that, among other things, I may not be the best person to be giving you um, advice about how to manage your own anxiety or your loved ones, since I'm not cured myself. You know, my anxiety often makes me miserable. And over the years, it has caused me to forego certain professional opportunities, especially those that involve public speaking or foreign travel, for instance. But I've mostly been able to manage my anxiety well enough to have a productive career. So I can give some advice about muddling uh, along. Um, I also, you know, uh, read deeply into the latest thinking um, uh, on, on clinical treatment. So I can give you some lessons from that. And finally, at the end of this talk, I want to try to provide some hope um, and um, redemption that might pro provide a little bit of solace for any of you who suffer from anxiety or who have family members who are anxiety sufferers. Um, um. So if I were to distill, so like I said, I spent, I really spent 10 years working on this book. And if I were to distill the collected wisdom of the ages, um, you know, from the ancient physician Hippocrates to the late, latest cutting edge studies into a few simple rules, um, for reducing anxiety, they would be these. Um, and these are all easier said than done. And I would say, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, you know, want less, relax more, uh, cultivate an optimistic outlook, you know, smile and you will be happy. Help others, be of service, look outward, not inward. Simplify, um, declutter your life. You know, and there's, I find that there's a lot of overlap among sort of cognitive behavioral principles, um, Buddhism and Stoic, ancient Stoic philosophy. So there is, this is wisdom that goes back thousands of years. Train yourself if possible, you know, to do the opposite of what anxious people normally do. Train yourself to underreact. You know, my brain naturally wants to overreact. The, 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 the slightest trigger in my amygdala flares and I'm overreacting, but you can teach yourself to underreact. Um, Confront your fears and phobias, expose yourself to them, decondition the fear. And again, this is the heart of exposure therapy and, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And I had a therapist um, who used to always say, um, he used to quote an old Chinese proverb, which said, go into the heart of danger for there you will find safety. Once you're in the midst of the thing that is scaring you, it can't scare you anymore. Or so he says, <laughs> um, change what you can, but accept the things you can't as the serenity prayer has it internalize your locus of control, but accept that you can't control everything. Um, try to develop a sense of self-efficacy, believe that you can cope because you probably can cope better than you think. And I have a friend who suffers from anxiety disorders and, you know, she talks about every time she's able to manage a situation, it's a data point. And she sort of writes down those data points and then collects them because the more data points that you have, the more your brain is telling you, I can't handle this. This is too scary. You can look at the objective piece of paper that has all your data points and says you can. Um, sleep. 
sleeplessness creates anxiety, which breeds more sleeplessness, which is a horrible, vicious cycle, um, which is tied to the elevation of stress hormones in your blood and the stimul stimulation of your amygdala. So in desperate times, if you really can't sleep, you know, pharmacological sleep aids may be called for, um, you know, because when good ang when anxiety is too intense, good sleep is impossible. And without good sleep, the anxiety will never relent. But also be wary of uh, drug dependency, which some of these sleep aids can cause. Um, you know, meditate, cultivate mind, body awareness. I've really in recent years tried to do this. Um, you know, if you want biomedical justification for doing this medication, you know, or sorry, meditation, you know, all kinds of studies have shown, you know, actually can shrink the volume of your amygdala, which again is the sort of fear reactor and can strengthen your neocortex and think, thicken a part of your brain called your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, all of which make you more resistant to stress. Um, of course, an irony is that for people like me who are neurotic and twitchy to begin with, um, meditation is so hard at first. And it's really taken me a long time to build up little by little, but it really does help. Like I, I can, you know, and for me, like I always, I'm trying to find the scientific basis for why something will work. And, uh, you know, this, um, uh, there's the, the evidence about like the thickening of your, of your neocortex. I try to imagine that happening while I'm meditating, um, cut down on social media consumption or get away from it entirely, especially for kids eat healthier, drink, drink less caffeine. Um, and this is a really important one. And I know I sound like your mother or your, you know, family physician, but exercise, um, study after study has shown how physical activity can literally change your brain chemistry, elevate your mood and reduce your anxiety. Um, you know, a half hour of exercise boosts brain levels of serotonin and norepinephrine to neurochemicals, um, that, and produces endorphins, which are like amino acid peptides that enhance feelings of pleasure and reduce feelings of pain. But more than that, it, uh, exercise has now been shown to generate growth and activity of neurons in the hippocampus and a, a deficit of which of those neurons is, is tied to both anxiety and depression. And there are now plenty of studies that show that a regular exercise program can lead to significant improvement in 70 to 80% of anxious or depressed patients. Um, so, I'm, I mean, just for one example, when I was 22 in the clutches of anxiety and depression that had me kind of, I was weeping myself to sleep every night at that point, two things more than anything else helped me kind of emerge from the darkness. And one was going on an antidepressant and the other was joining a gym and, and 30 minutes on the treadmill did far more than my weekly psychotherapy appointments did. So, uh, and then most important, try to cultivate, um, you know, emotional resilience. And again, this is easier said than done, but resilience is a trait that modern psychology is increasingly finding to be a powerful bulwark uh, against anxiety and depression. And, you know, for many years, anxiety research traditionally focused on, you know, what is wrong with the brain of pathologically anxious people or what's wrong with their thinking. And instead, some, you know, new strains of research are, are focusing more on what makes some people so emotionally resilient and so resistant to developing anxiety disorders and other clinical conditions, including in situations of extreme st stress. So for instance, there's a guy named Dennis Charney, who's a neuroscientist, and he studied American prisoners of war in Vietnam who managed not, despite all the trauma they endured, to become depressed or develop PTSD. I mean, it's not to say they enjoyed their experiences there, but they found that what protected them um, were these qualities of psychological resilience and acceptance. And that allowed them to ward off a uh, psychological breakdown that you know afflicted so many other veterans. And he actually broke it down into 10 critical psychological elements. Um, and those are one, optimism, two, and this overlaps with what I said before, you know, altruism, helping other people, um, having a moral compass or set of beliefs that cannot be shattered, faith and spirituality, uh, having a sense of humor, having a role model or someone you can look up to, having social supports around you, family, friends, um, mental health community, um, being able to face fear and being okay with leaving one's comfort zone. And again, that gets into exposure therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, um, having a sort of purpose or meaning in life, and then training, just practice, meeting and overcoming challenges. Again, that's my friend's data points, you know, confront the thing that scares you. And I want to say to you that, you know, anxiety does, and I, I've had to wrestle with this myself in sort of, you know, being frustrated and not being able to rid myself of anxiety. Um, but it has some redemptive qualities if you can harness it correctly. And so Jerome Kagan, who for many years was a psychologist at Harvard who studied anxiety, says that he would hire only neurotic people as research assistants because he said um, they're compulsive and they don't make errors. 
Um, and a lot of research suggests uh, supports what Kagan says. Um, there was a study in the Academy of Management Journal, for instance, that found that neurotics contribute more to group projects than their coworkers would predict, while um, extroverted, relaxed people contribute less. Um, and in 2005, researchers in the United Kingdom published a paper called Can Worriers Be Winners? And that found that financial managers who were high in anxiety actually tended to be the best, most effective money managers. Um, stipulating that their worrying was accompanied also by a high IQ. And it kind of makes sense. You want somebody who's worried about your money if they're managing it. Um, Jeremy Copeland, who is a professor of psychiatry um, and neurobiologist, says that, you know, anxiety is, and Darwin said this, you know, evolutionary uh, anxiety is evolutionarily adaptive because every so often there's a wild card danger. And when such a danger arises, anxious people are more likely to be prepared. So worrying could be a good trait in leaders. Um, and in fact, lack of worrying can be dangerous. If, if people in leadership positions are incapable of seeing any danger, even when danger is imminent, they're likely, among other poor decisions, to indicate to the general populace that there's no need to worry. Um, there's really interesting studies on um, primates, uh, monkeys, that, that, that support this too. So Stephen Swomey, who was the chief of the Laboratory of Comparative Ethology at the National Institutes of Health, studied rhesus monkeys. And he identified ge genetically anxious monkeys. And when they took those monkeys, and this is really interesting too, because what it says about the um, intersection between genes and environment, um, when they took monkeys with anxious genes and gave them to parents who were not anxious, anxious, non-anxious monkey parents, a fascinating thing happened. Those monkeys with the anxious genes and the calm support of parents tended to grow up to become the leader of the monkey troops. <laughs> so this suggests that under the right circumstances, some quotient of anxiety can actually equip you to be you know, very effective and to be a leader. Now, as always, this comes with the proviso that anxiety is productive when it's not so strong as to be debilitating. But you know, if you're like me and are anxious, you can take heart from some of these findings. You know, I've also come to understand that my own nervous disposition is, is maybe an essential, well, it is an essential part of my being. I can't get rid of it. And as my current therapist always says, you know, the more comfortable I am being anxious, the less anxious I'll be, which is some sort of maddening Zen Cohen. But anyway, um, you know, and my wife once said, you know, I hate your anxiety and I hate that it makes you so miserable. But what if there are things that I love about you that are connected to your anxiety? And she sort of got to the heart of the matter and said, what if, what if you're cured of your anxiety and you become a total jerk? And I suspect that I might. I mean, it may be that my anxiety lends me sort of an inhibition and a degree of social sensitivity. You know, I'm anxiously scanning um, for people's responses that make me more attuned to other people um, and make me more a more tolerable spouse than I otherwise would be. Um, and, you know, the notion of a connection between anxiety and morality like predates my wife's observations or even of modern science. St. Augustine believed that fear was adaptive because it helped people behave morally and um, you know, a novelist, uh, Angela Carter, calls anxiety the beginnings of conscience. And I think there's something to that. Um, so my anxiety is can be intolerable, but it's also, you know, I, 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 I try to think a, a gift or at least the other side of a coin that I wouldn't necessarily want to trade in. And um, there's a famous literary critic named Edwin Wilson, who I was learned about in college and has always been a fan of. And he wrote a 1941 essay called The Wound and the Bow, um, where he wrote about... Um, a character from a Sophocles play named Philoctetes, who was the sort of mythical figure who had a separating, never healing snake, snake bite wound on his foot. And somehow that wound was magically linked to a gift for unerring accuracy with his bow and arrow. Um, so, uh, you know, as Sophocles puts it, his malodorous disease was inseparable from his superhuman art for marksmanship. And I, I've always enjoyed, I've been drawn to that parable. And in it lies sort of the nearness, you know, of the wound to the gift um, and the insight that in weakness and in shamefulness, the thing you're ashamed of can also be the potential for transcendence, heroism, you know, or redemption. And so my anxiety remains an unhealed wound that at times hold me back, holds me back and fills me with shame. But it may also be at the same time a source of strength uh, and a bestower of certain blessings. And I will say that one of the experiences of, um, you know, writing the book, is, you know, many people friends, colleagues, and total strangers came forward to share their own stories of uh, their anxiety or their family members. 
And to say that my publicly revealing my anxiety somehow made them feel more hopeful or feel less alone. Um, and some of them even wrote to say that my book had inspired them to change their lives after years of being stuck in bad habits and maladaptive thoughts. And that in a few cases had somehow even cured them. And this made me both feel good and envious because um, I found it a little ironic that my own writing about anxiety seemed to reduce other people's anxiety, but it doesn't seem to eliminate um, my own. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what, what, and this comes back to, I wanted to sort of end on, uh, I guess, two final notes. One is, you know, what brought me a, 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 some degree of relief has been trying to um, embrace the stigma, or that is to say, be less afraid of the stigma. And that bringing my sort of externally presented self, which, which you know, can come across as competent and confident, um, you know, make it more in line with my anxious self. So I'm 54 years old and I was diagnosed with anxiety disorders when I was 10. And so for 35 years, roughly, I hid this fact. Um, you know, nobody except my family and my closest friends, a very few of them knew that I suffered this way. And I would always concoct elaborate explanations for my, when I was going to therapy or hiding my medications, doing everything I could do to hide if I was feeling anxious because it felt shameful um, to reveal weakness. And, you know, before I published the book, I anguished a lot in my sessions with my then psychotherapist, Dr. W, as I call him in the book, about coming out um, as suffering from clinical anxiety. Um, so I am still anxious, as I say, I still have bad episodes. I'm, I remain medicated, but Dr. W was right in publishing the book, um, you know, and coming out as anxious has been maybe moderately um, therapeutic and the world didn't end. Um, and again, I, I, uh, again, I'm not sure how my book has made other people feel less anxious because I'm definitely not cured. I think sometimes people's recognizing their own experiences in my own made them feel somehow less alone. And I think the fact that I have, you know, mostly managed to muddle along and muddle along and lead a productive life, um, you know, helps people feel like, well, maybe there is hope for them too. And of course, I feel this is added anxiety because I'm like, I feel additional pressure to hold it together and not completely break down because I'll be letting all these people down. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my old therapist called this impression management. And again, you know, that is useful to a point as we go through lives, we all have our public faces, but, you know, needing to hide who you really are can be toxic and toxic. And so as I say, I'm trying to learn how it's a okay to be to appear anxious and th again this may seem like a strange thing for me to be saying to you since i'm talking to you as a guy who's written a book about being anxious so you all know that i suffer from anxiety but i still have this inner resistance to revealing my anxiety in the moment um and the trick is to learn to be okay with showing my anxiety which will have the effect of making me feel less anxious uh you know less anxious um so I just wanted to, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll really end with um, a few notes for kind of caring for loved ones who, who may be suffering from anxiety, as I know many of you may do. You know, and as I mentioned, one of the insidious things about anxiety is that because it has such a strong um, genetic component, um, as well as a strong environmental component, which is to say it can be contagious. Um, you know, if you're in an anxious and if you're around anxious people, they will make you anxious because you'll model them and they just kind of raise the overall level of agitation. So you know, so I have managed, um, you know, to gift different elements of my own anxiety to my children. I have two kids, just as my great grandfather and my grandparents gifted it to my mother and my mother gifted it to my sister and to me. And, you know, fortunately for me, having, you know, done all this research and anxiety, and I hope being in a more enlightened age and a less, uh, an age where, where mental health issues are less stigmatized, um, Getting my kids early, um, you know, they both started presenting with anxiety of different kinds at age five in one case and seven in the other. And we intervened early, which, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists recommend that you do and 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 got both of them with good um, cognitive behavioral therapists. And it was really, really effective um, for both of them. And um, they have both since then, that was when they were five and seven, they're now 16 and 20. Um, they're both much less anxious than I was and than I am. Um, and, um, and they're much less, uh, ashamed of talking about it with me, um, than I, you know, than I was with my parents and, and with their friends. Um, and, um, you know, they, 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 and, and this is, you know, 
progress. Um, and a lot of the, you know, cutting edge thinking about treating anxiety in kids, you know, ha has to actually do with treating the parents um, or other caregivers. And in part, as I say, this is because we know anxiety is genetic. And so it's quite likely that the relatives may actually be anxiety disorder themselves. But more than that, you know, and I struggle with this a lot myself, um, you, you know, when you see your child in distress, um, even if it's not merited, you know, it's like they're, they're not in danger, but they're, but they're, they're crying because they're anxious. My urge, like I think many parents urge, most parents urge is to go and make them feel better and to protect them from the thing that is scaring them, even if there is no reason for them to be scared of it. And that by and large is the wrong response. Um, you know, what I got from my mom was kind of the worst combination for an anxious kid, a mixture of overprotection, like don't do this, don't do that. You can't handle that. You're not safe. The world is dangerous combined with a kind of withholding of affection. And that's, um, you know, I, I never developed what attachment theorists call a secure base in the world. And I never felt comfortable. Kids on the other hand who do develop a feeling of secure attachment to their parents, but also have the ability to soothe themselves. Um, and this can go, this is not just for children, but for anyone, you know, um, without um, someone coming in to say, you can't handle it, I'm going to rescue you from this. They will then learn to manage it themselves. And this is true starting in infancy, but the pattern continues across the lifespan. And this is a lot of what CBT for anxious patients is, 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 is kind of teaching you to, um, you know, learning what your maladaptive beliefs are, but also exposing you to the things that you know, make you scared and making you learn through that experience that you can tolerate the anxiety and give you practice riding out the scary moment. Um, and again, this is very much a do as I say, do as I do, um, both as a parent and as an anxious person. You know, I always have to fight my powerful impulse to overcoddle my kids and to protect them from all harm and distress. Um, but, you know, like I say, I, I, I think um, my wife's much better at it than I am. And um, that's good for my kids because as I say, they are both much more competent, capable. Um, you know, they will always have neurotic temperaments. It's in their genes and in their hard wiring. Um, but all of us, uh, you know, can, can diminish our anxiety. So I, I guess, I'll, I, you know, anxiety can be persistent. It can be treatment resistant, but it is among, of the various psychological disorders, it is among the more highly treatable. Um, cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy have a pretty high rate of success. Um, as, as I mentioned, does mindfulness meditation and, um, and if anyone's interested in the programs for kids, there's a couple really good ones out here on the East coast, one at Yale university and one at the university of Maryland. I'm sure there's ones on the West coast, but I can provide more information about those. Um, you know, and meanwhile, as neuroscience and genetic explorations advance, you know, there always remains, uh, you know, I have this secret wish for some kind of like magic bullet on the horizon that will, you know, the non-toxic, non-addictive treatment that will somehow, just calm down my hyperactive amygdala and allow me to feel, you know, always at ease in the world, unless I'm being legitimately chased by a tiger or something and not to be so debilitated um, and infantilized by my anxiety and terror. But until then um, I will continue to muddle along as best I can and to try to help other folks um, who are suffering from this um, learn to manage it better themselves. So I've probably gone on um, longer than I ought to have, but um, um I'll stop there and um, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. That was really just an, an awesome delivery, like Francis says in the chat here. And um, I think we're ready. Are there any other final questions? Give it a couple of seconds. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for having me. You know, it's been a um, uh, pleasure to, um, you seem like a nice, uh, welcoming, non-anxiety provoking group. Um, <laughs> so thank you. So happy thank to you. do that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, thank you so much, Scott, for coming on here and, and sharing your story with us and giving us a little bit of insight into all the things that you've learned along the way. Um, and we appreciate all of you for coming here tonight. And and this is going to be posted online, right? On our website? Or... Yeah, I will, I will post this on our website um, under our general meetings archive, in case anyone's curious. Um, Terrific. And, and, if, and if folks are interested, you know, I'm, I think um, 
you know, the Amanda has my email and, and, you know, there are other resources. Again, I'm more familiar with specific resources out here on the East coast. Um, but like I'm, uh, you know, have had affiliation with the ADAA, which is the anxiety and depression association of America. And, you know, they're good at helping, um, find therapists, you know, wherever you may be and, um, other just online resources and things like that. So I'm happy to be, um, contacted again i'm you know i'm not myself a trained um psychiatrist or psychologist or therapist but um i know a lot just from living through it and right. reading a lot about it so thank you so much that's that's awesome um, have a good evening everybody have a great